playing nothing but Dubbo's best music from the 80s to now. That's Galanis and Heartbreak Anthem, it's called here at Zoo Brecky this morning. We want to say very good morning from a very chilly Tasmania to Dubbo Regional. Uh, Mayor Matthew Dickerson, have you gone bike riding over there, sir, in the cold? It's a bit cold over here at the moment. I don't know if anyone's reminded Tasmania that we're moving into the warmer months. So uh, there's only going to be a top of 21 today, sitting at 15 degrees at the moment, so a bit chilly compared to Dubbo. And then it gets colder as the week goes on. At this stage, no, it's just sitting around getting some work done in the nice warm hotel room. Yeah, that's it. Well, it's not just about enjoying yourself because the Roads Congress gets underway. What's going to happen with that quickly? Well, I'd like to tell you what's going to happen with that, but I, at this stage... Obviously, there will be lots of discussions to be had, lots of presentations around different aspects of roads, roads funding. There's actually one segment I'm keen to listen to on EVs and how you can get EVs into your roads and get more people using EVs, which is interesting. I've actually hired an EV while I'm here, so that's good. You can actually get better access to EVs. But with any conference like this, it's really about discussing different ideas, talking about different facets of maybe funding, maybe different road infrastructure construction methods, I'm really keen to see if anyone's come up with some different innovative ideas there because we've been doing roads in a similar way for a long period of time and as we see with our roads at the moment, they don't handle the wet weather that well. So is there something different we should be doing? So I'm keen to hear all the exchange of ideas that's going to occur here. I know the member for Dubbo Tuchel Saunders was on not all that long ago. Last half hour he mentioned about a new makeup of roads. Uh, there could be uh, potentially uh, some way of doing roads a little bit different than the asphalt. Well, that's exactly right. I actually had a discussion with both Dougald and Sam Faraway, who's the Minister for Regional Roads and Transport, and we were talking about exactly that. And, and in fact, I was on the phone with the Premier last week and I was mentioning that as well, that maybe there should be some research done on some different road construction methods. And they mentioned to me that they've been doing some work in construction methods over in the Netherlands to see if they might be applicable here in Australia. So that's a, a good point as well. We might not need to do the research here in Australia. Looking across the world, there are Millions of kilometres of bitumen, I'm sure, that have been built across the world. Surely someone's been working on how to do those better and can we apply some of those methods in Australia? And I hear the Minister for Regional Roads and Transport, Sam Faraway, has told uh, those mayors that are, are being a little bit critical about the $50 million pothole boost that they can give it back. <laughs> that seems fair and reasonable too. I did say to Sam, and I was at the conference last week when Sam made the announcement, and he got a cheer across the 700 delegates that were at the conference when he announced $50 million. As you can imagine, you turn up to any conference with $50 million in your back pocket, people are going to be pretty happy about it. And I did say to Sam, thank you very much, we appreciate that. That's, if you average it out across the 95 councils, that's probably a little bit over half a million dollars that each council will get. So I actually did say to them, look, I thank you for that, but we do need more. So as much as we don't want to give it back, obviously, and I wasn't one of those mayors being highly critical, I just did say that we did need more to put it in some sort of uh, way of looking at how much we've got, how much that half a million dollars means. At the moment, in our current budget, we're spending $28 million in this financial year. That's just Dubbo. We also have identified before this latest series of rain events that we had about a $40 million backlog in terms of what we need to do to get our roads to an acceptable standard. So you can imagine when you put the $40 million and the $28 million and then you put half a million against that, it gives you an idea that, yes, it's going to help, but it's not going to get anywhere near solving the problem. But wasn't this uh, just their way of kick-starting council's repairs for the, the worst potholes and then you can you know get on with the job, so to speak? Well, it, it certainly is just a way of giving us some more money to spend, but it's a, a scratching the surface really on what needs to be done. But again, I, I'm not being critical. I'm saying thank you very much, but I'm also holding out my hand, my other hand, and saying please give me some more because we need some more. But again, let's look at innovative solutions, and that's what we're trying to look at. We don't want to just sit back and keep complaining to the government and say, please give us more, please give us more. We've got to work out ways to solve our problems for our residents as well. And we're looking at some different ways of bringing some funding forward. And that might be with some developers, that might be with some of our renewable energy zone, for example. We're looking at different ways. Can we go and reconstruct those roads now, potentially borrow money to do that, knowing that we'll have some of that money coming in guaranteed down the track from developers or from renewable energy proponents or even from energy co as building some more transmission lines, are we better off doing that rather than waiting for those organisations to come along and spend that money? So that's just one different way we're looking at it. So we've got to come up with different ideas, Brett. We can't just sit around and wait for someone to come along and give us a present. It looks like our neighbouring mayor at Narrabine, Shy Craig Davies, has called on the state government there to step up and do more to help flood-affected rural communities in the central west. I know you can't speak for Craig, but is that what you see across western New South Wales, that this is bordering on devastation there, there Craig's words? 
Well, the, certainly the amount of water we've had through the whole area is unprecedented. We don't, don't have this sort of rain event and these sort of rain events going on. The soil saturation level is at the highest levels we've ever seen, ever recorded those soil saturation levels. So there's no doubt about it that these are times that are very difficult. And we're going to see more of this, Brett. We're going to see more of these extreme weather events. We're going to see more times of drought, longer droughts, and we're going to see more extreme wet weather events. We've got to work out ways to be able to go forward. And I don't, I don't have the easy answer for that one, but I, I suppose part of the solution is not just jumping up and down and complaining. We've got to start to, to solve some of these problems ourselves. There are 128 councils across the state. We can't expect the state government just to magically click their fingers and solve the problems for all of those different councils. And I think the Narrowmine Shire's uh, uh, Narrowmine Shy Mayor's comments were about getting the state government ready to have a long list because this is, you know, it's go- you're going to need that into the future, no doubt. But that's that that's part of it. And one of the things that I often talk to people about when they ask council for more funding for certain areas, one of the problems you have, of course, is that you do actually have a limited bucket. So you've only got so much money to be able to spend on anything. It doesn't matter what that is. There's only so much money to spend. So if you say, please give us some more money for roads, as it might be, then what are you going to miss out on? It's not as if you can make more money magically appear. And that's it's all about prioritisation. And that's the really difficult part. And even we find that at council, when someone says, can you please repair my road? That's a really important road. But we've got 2,872 kilometres of roads in our LGA, and there are lots of people out there who think their road is the most important, and they've all got valid arguments for it, but we just can't do everything. So it is about prioritisation. All right. Tax of road temporary uh, road closure and access restrictions. I know you mentioned this on Friday uh, to our news desk in regards to a four and a half uh, tonne limit out there. How long is this going to last for? Yeah, this will be some period of time there and two things to keep in mind from this. This actually road was built by Wellington Shire Council and to be fair to Wellington Shire Council, I don't think it was ever built with the volume of traffic and the weight of traffic that we are now seeing on that particular road. So that road is crumbling, there is no doubt about that at all. To try and protect that road, we've put a limit on there to say no trucks on the road. And of course, when you say no trucks, what does that mean? So we had to put some sort of definition on it. So four and a half ton gross vehicle mass, we're defining as above that is a truck. You're not allowed to go on that road with a truck. If you've got a car or a ute or a full drive, anything below four and a half tons, you can take it on that road. The exception to that is if you've got local traffic. So if you're a farm along that way and you need to have cattle picked up from that farm or when you get some wheat crops, for example, and you need to have wheat taken away from your farm, if you've got a vehicle over four and a half tonnes, it's allowed to go on that road, but only specifically for local traffic, only to service someone along that road. We do see, for example, other freight that goes along that road normally because it's a convenient freight route that connects the Mitchell Highway across to the Golden Highway. But if your sole purpose of going on that road is to connect between those two areas or to go on that road just to basically take transport or freight along that road, then that won't be allowed. It will only be allowed for local traffic above four and a half tonnes or other traffic, other normal traffic below four and a half tonnes. Matt, you can't tell me, though, that the last two road events has, uh, you know, made this road worse than it has been. Hasn't this been a long, long time coming for Saxa Road? The last two road events have made it worse. You're right, okay. though. It was in a poor state of repair. It has been crumbling. And I would probably say that over the last six months, it's been deteriorating fairly rapidly. Again, you've had all this subsoil moisture. You've had rain going across the road. You've had rain getting into the road, any cracks, for example, that might be in the bitumen. And then you put very heavy vehicles on it. And at some point, it just had to be stopped. There are sheets of bitumen that have been washed away there, for example. There are potholes that started off as small potholes that are now very large potholes that can do damage to vehicles. So it has gotten worse recently, but it has been a deterioration over a period of time. All right. Uh, Preparation of renewable energy benefit framework. Uh, You've endorsed that preparation. What does that mean for us now? What that means for us is that we might get some extra money out of some of these proponents. One of the things that's very confusing for me, and I've never been able to get a great answer on this, is that if you put a wind farm in, you've got to give some money back to the community. For example, the Bedangra Wind Farm spends $85,000 or contributes $85,000 to our community every year, and that's indexed for the life of that farm. You've got the Oongla Wind Farm, which is a proposal that's basically at the finalisation stage and will start construction shortly, they're going to contribute $320,000 to the community. 
the 200 megawatt solar farm along that Mudgee Road on the left-hand side as you're driving out towards Mudgee there, huge solar farm there. It powers 72,500 homes. That's fantastic for the state, fantastic for Wellington, except they contribute nothing because solar farms don't have to contribute anything. Wind farms do. So what we've given our staff the direction to do is go and prepare a framework that will say we want some money out of any of these renewable energy proponents, whether they be wind or solar. The minor problem we have is that it's compulsory for a wind farm to contribute funds. It's not compulsory for a solar farm. We're trying to change the conversation there and get the solar farms to contribute as part of their social licence and as part of something that's good for the area, but it's very difficult because, A, we're not the consent authority, and, B, it's not compulsory for them to do it. But we need that framework in place to be able to try and encourage some of those. And certainly I had a discussion with the Premier last week about making it compulsory for those solar farms because I don't understand why it's not at the moment. If we can get some money out of these organisations, we can spend some of that money on roads, for example. Sounds like a bit of a battle on your hands with that one. <laughs> yeah, I think it will be. No one, no business that I know of is going to volunteer funds if they don't have to. So we've got to try and work out a way to encourage them strongly enough to do it for the good of the community and even though it's not compulsory for them to do it. So that's a bit of a challenge. All right, quickly running out of time, but uh, two great things. Uh, the New Victoria Park Fitness Centre opened to the public over the weekend. This is great news for uh, all of the residents and visitors. Have you used it yet? No, you, you know I'm not very fit, right? <laughs> I think this is really important. As we go around our community, we do see various activity centres and they're in different shapes and forms. So this is the former Livy's Playground space that's been redeveloped now. $360,000 was spent on that. And a big thanks to the Titan Macquarie Mud Run because they contributed $15,000 towards it. Now, the Mud Run often contributes money to various fitness equipment along the Macquarie River. This is a bit further away from the Macquarie, but great to see the Mud Run, which is a great event for Dubbo anyway, but great to see them contributing funds to this. Now, one of the things I'm most excited about this, Brett, is you've got QR codes on some of the equipment, and that actually, you scan the QR code, and then on your phone, it'll demonstrate the correct use of that equipment. But I just like the idea that we've got technology implemented as part of this whole new playground area. All right. Uh, plenty of people receiving some cute, uh, money from the Community Events Fund and Destination Events Fund. What I love about these, Brett, is that I talk to some of these organisations when we're handing over the cheques and I say, what are you going to do with that money we give you? And we're talking about amounts of maybe $1,000, $2,000. So they're not huge sums of money. And what I see them do is use their volunteers, use some of their own money and really increase the exposure, increase the money that they turn it into and I think it's fantastic. So we talk about things like, for example, the Man from Ironbark Festival, we give them $2,500. They turn that into a huge festival. It's a fantastic event for the community. Wellington Show, $3,000 again, turns into a great thing there. So you've got these different events that are absolutely fantastic events and well done to all these volunteers that have been fantastic at turning those events into really big events with a small contribution from council. Dubbo Regional Mayor Matt Dickinson, I hope you bring back some uh, great news for us in regards to electric vehicles and how we can use that and make our city better. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you, Brett. 27 past 8 at Zubrecki.